Uh, good morning. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Nick. It's a great privilege to be here at Wired. Uh, I have to say I've been feeling all morning since I arrived completely overdressed. Uh, such a cool, trendy audience. What is even more <laughs> maddening, I, I decided yesterday I wasn't going to be so, but I was so short of time this morning I, I ended up like this. And I, I do have a pair of those cool shoes that are so many people <laughs> wandering around here with. So irritated with myself. Anyhow, there you go. Thank you very much for the opportunity for me to talk to you very briefly uh, about antimicrobial resistance. Uh, how many of you here know what antimicrobial resistance is? How many of you don't? There you go, about a third of you. Uh, two years ago when I got a phone call from a very senior uh, government official uh, to ask me whether I would lead a review into AMR, I said, what is that? Uh, and he explained, my wife happened to be stood next to me when it was on my mobile phone and she has a health background and she gave me that sort of filthy look as to, is finance like the only thing you know anything about? Uh, and here we are two years later. Uh, I started leading this review uh, about 18 months ago. Three weeks yesterday, we're going to publish uh, our final recommendations. We were given an enormous uh, task uh, to identify how we stop this being a massive problem, come up with solutions and ones that will get embraced by policymakers around the world uh, and put this uh, threat behind us. And I'm going to give you a little snapshot as to where we are three weeks before we finish. Um, so I was asked deliberately as an economist to do this because Inside the uh, narrow world of experts, there is a lot of knowledge about the issues, uh, but perhaps with some other scientific challenges in health, Jeremy, maybe something to touch on afterwards, uh, it's often the case that because of the, the structures that people don't seem to be able to get through to get the solutions that are needed. Uh, and so we've deliberately tried to think uh, uh, boldly, but in an economics context. And we started out by trying to show uh, what scale of problem uh, this is in an economic sense. And here's uh, a snapshot. I, I hope at the back you can see these things clearly. I know if I was sitting there, it would be absolutely impossible for me to do, but I'm about 500 years older than most people here. Somebody's got a hand up. Um, what this shows you is that uh, in the middle, around 700,000 people around the world are dying from AMR today way more from all these scary things that keep happening in various isolated spots of the world. If we don't do something about, of it, uh, about it in another 35 years, that could be 10 million. 10 million. More uh, in 35 years from the number of people that are dying from cancer. Um, in my own uh, economics and financial world, uh, in many ways, this uh, to that universe is uh, striking and particularly important in terms of what we do to spend on stopping it happening. Uh, this shows you the accumulated economic cost of not doing anything about it, uh, about $100 trillion. Size of the world economy today is about $80 trillion. So we could lose more than what otherwise would be uh, a potential doubling of the world economy. So against that background, we then uh, sat around. There's just a team of six of us along with me, by the way, two of which are sitting on the second row here, and tried to identify all the different issues that we thought needed to be done to tackle this problem. And we sort of have a 10-point plan that has been uh, our, especially my dogma, much to the irritation of my colleagues, uh, throughout the past 18 months or from the early days. And let me just quickly uh, read through what they are. Uh, first of all, uh, linked to the fact that one third of the uh, very highly informed audience here don't know what it is, there needs to be a huge global public awareness campaign. And in our final report, we will uh, actually specify as to how that might need to be done. And given some of the technology capabilities uh, in the place like this, maybe that a, a late entry for the startups, maybe somebody can think up uh, an even better idea than we have about how you do that. Uh, number two, uh, some of the most basic things in life. Sally Davis, the Chief Medical Officer of the UK, who was, uh, along with Jeremy, one of the major inspirations for our review, uh, has this thing about washing hands. 
Washing hands and basic sanitation, particularly in the emerging world, which are of course needed in any case, <laughs> an enormous part of reducing this issue. Thirdly, we need to uh, introduce uh, a much better uh, behavioural habit in the whole uh, universe of agriculture. I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, we need to develop global surveillance in many parts of the world, including parts of the developed world. We don't actually really know the scale of uh, many of the issues. There are initiatives that are already in train as a result of our review in that. Uh, vaccines can play a, a massive role uh, as a replacement or substitute for antibiotics. Sixthly, uh, on what I call the supply side, we actually need to get more people just studying it. If you look at the numbers that work in health, surprise, surprise, because there isn't a lot of money in this in the perception of people, much less people work in this than in many other fashionable things and those that do are paid less. Uh, linked to uh, a number of these things, and, and a particularly big thing for me to emphasize here, is we need state-of-the-art diagnostics, or what I love to call Google for doctors, and I'll come back to that. Uh, we need to get new drugs, which when it was put to me that this is what we needed to do, many think is the single biggest uh, uh, thing that our review needed to do. Come back to that in a second. Uh, linked to that, uh, there's a clear need, and, and more uh, researchers, we believe there's a need for a new, let's call it global startup fund or innovation fund. And then lastly, especially linked to some of supposedly my knowledge and background, we need to get this agreed all over the world and have some kind of G20 agreements about doing something about this as well as something at the United Nations. So going into a bit of those a little bit more, so putting it in economic parlance, we need to shift the demand curve and we need to also shift the supply curve. And, and of those 10 things, you can split uh, about five and a half of them into demand curve shifting things and three, three and a half of them into supply curve shifting things. Uh, in addition to uh, the PR campaign, here's some of the biggies uh, on shifting the demand curve. Uh, I talked uh, a second ago already uh, about Google for doctors. We live in a world, uh, and you guys know this so much better than me, where these damn things completely dominate our lives. Do you ever get one of your doctors getting one of these out and say whether you need an antibiotic or not? No. Pretty crazy in this stage of our lives. This shows you a little chart from a, a survey in the US that more than 50, in this particular study, more than 50% uh, of the antibiotics that were given out were not needed. If we get state-of-the-art diagnostics, that will change. And we have got a very aggressive uh, proposal that we're going to make, particularly for Western countries, as to how that should be accelerated. Number two, vaccines play a role on the demand and the supply side. Uh, if we had vaccines used a lot more for prevention, then in many, many applications, there would be no need for the antibiotics in the first place, particularly true uh, in my view, in agriculture. I'm glad you guys at the back can see these things because I'm struggling from here. Uh, said already uh, about the very basics, we've got some really kind of cool uh, new aggressive things, but we need to do some of the basics well. Uh, washing hands, sanitation, one of the last studies we published leading up to this p position we're in today showed that just in diarrhea, in some of the most uh, challenged emerging countries in the world, if we had basic better uh, water and sanitation, um, the interplayed with the role of, uh, in many cases, inappropriate antibiotics, you could cut by 60% uh, uh, this uh, horrible threat, particularly to young uh, people. Agriculture in itself is a whole separate challenge from humans. Uh, where, given my background, I know a lot of people in the States, when I first told people that I was doing this, most of them saying, what the hell are you doing that for? And then uh, when it came to people in the US, they immediately associated this with an issue in food and animals and not in humans. Perhaps 70% of all antibiotics in the US are, are, are in agriculture rather than humans. Massive challenge all over the world, especially the likes of China and India too. 
So there's a snapshot of the demand reduction things, and we, in three weeks, are going to have some very specific recommendations about all of those. On the supply side, <coughs> here's a snapshot of what we're doing there. The basic problem is that we are running out of antibiotics. There's not been a genuine, real big new discovery, Jeremy, for what, 30 years? This is a bit of a picture of the pipeline, and it's pretty worrying. We don't do something about this. It won't be able to influence the next 10 years or so, because that's how long it takes. But the most basic of things that our, civilized, our uh, generation has become accustomed to, cesarean births, cancer treatments, we've even seen some specialists say, even a graze on the knee, you might not be able to get the underlying treatment that can deal with that if we don't have the antibiotics. The problem is, it's really tough to do, and it costs a lot of money. And in this very competitive world where finance and return on equity is so high, big pharma ain't interested. And the reason why a lot of people said this is our biggest challenge is we've got to come up with a system to try and persuade them to be interested. Uh, we uh, have already identified some of that. Here are the big three supply-side related solutions. I've already mentioned we had a new Global Innovation Fund. I'm not sure. Let me do a quick show of hands here. I see the light going yellow, so I'm taking a risk. How many people here are involved in a startup to do with antimicrobial resistance? I think I see a hand up. I think I see one hand, two hands. Well, we need to boost that fivefold at least. And we hope uh, and we know there is the beginnings of an innovation fund that both China and the UK have committed some money to towards supporting. Uh, secondly, and our specific proposal is we're suggesting you need a lump sum payment to reward the pharma company that actually succeeds in bringing along the right specific new drug that we need. Uh, and in terms of the cost of all of this, and remember I said if we don't do something about it, it'll cost the world a hundred trillion dollars that it otherwise would get. To do these things, and for all the new drugs we need, new innovation fund, probably no more than $30 billion uh, over the next decade. That is about one quarter of a percent of global GDP. It is less than the top three US big pharma companies spent on buying back their own shares so far this decade. So uh, we need some uh, pretty powerful, sustainable ways to get this sorted out. And uh, in our final document, we are going to be precisely saying how the money can be raised and suggest some alternative ones. <laughs> it could simply be uh, the taxpayer. Uh, it could be existing forms of finance from international institutions. World Bank could play a role. Or the pharma companies themselves may be, let's call it, incentivized to think of it in their enlightened self-interest uh, to come up with the money. Wait for three weeks' time and we will show you what we think should be the right one. So the next steps uh, in uh, uh, three weeks yesterday, our final report will be out. We hope there will be a lot of noise about that then uh, we will disband them as an independent review, but some of my team will join others in government policy here in the UK that are already starting to work on turning some of this uh, into implementation and critically linked to the last one, helping me push our uh, global leaders through the G20 and the United Nations to come up this year with agreements at both the G20 and the United Nations to put some of these dreadful threats behind us and therefore not have us all worrying about these things going forward. Thank you very much for having me. Nice thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> so Jim, um, when you're talking to people in government at the highest level, when you're at international conferences meeting heads of state, ministers of health. Like, like I do that like every day. But how much urgency do you see in that circle to crack this? Uh, well, it's changing. Um, we were really quite enthused 
it's amazing what you get enthused about when you've a small group together, as I'm sure you all know. Um, the, the Turkish G20 this year, actually in its last, after <laughs> anybody ever looked at these things, enormous documents, uh, the second last paragraph, I think it was, actually had a stated commitment to doing something about antimicrobial resistance. We did not think uh, that would have happened. You would have asked me a year ago, what are the odds of something being said at the G20 under the Turkish leadership? I would have said close to zero. A bit, a bit like Leicester winning the uh, championship, <laughs> premiership. Um, from my experience as a finance guy and observing all of these things as a markets person, once something gets onto the G20 agenda, it doesn't get off until they've done something about it. So that was a tiny little mention, but a big moment. And I know uh, that that's already resulted in some discussion amongst the so-called Sherpas. Um, I have to say, um, not just being a government person, because uh, I'm sort of a slightly odd person to be in government, but uh, as we travel around the world as a team, as we have done, we've done it particularly to the BRICS countries in the States, uh, the respect and uh, appreciation for our Prime Minister to decide that this is of such global importance that we should have an independent review is, is, is huge and growing. And we now uh, are, are sort of regarded as sort of allies of all the big international health organisations to perhaps be a conduit to pushing things through uh, that might otherwise have not been possible. He said optimistically. I'm on the committee of something called the Longitude Prize yeah. which is um, a government-backed, Nesta-run grand challenge with a £10 million prize to the team that can come up with the best chance of solving this problem by 2019. Do you think initiatives like these have any real hope of making a difference, or do you think it is going to be the start-up, the pharmaceutical company with the financial incentive that's going to do it? Can I give you... <coughs> Uh, I can think of many parts of answering that, but I'll give you three quick ones. First of all, the Longitude Prize is choosing that was a, a, a really fantastic thing, even though in the scheme of things, 10 million, frankly, is a you know, small amount for what's needed. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that in the anniversary of that, uh, they did a bit of a, their own awareness, and I think it had, uh, their, their evidence showed it had arisen 14-fold over it was from when they first did it. So in that sense, it's just, just for doing that, it's fantastic. Second thing, as I said, uh, one of our recommendations is for a, a huge global awareness campaign. We, we talk about some kind of maj major Bollywood uh, movie in India. You know, India. India's got it, so many challenges, but it, its challenges about antimicrobial resistance are, are massive. So you, 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 know, you need something like that in, in uh, WeChat, uh, the, the, which is a huge Chinese app, which are, interestingly, the, is, I believe, is, is now getting into Africa in a significant way. Um, you could see a role for, for them playing. Thirdly, specifically related to the Innovation Fund, uh, in, in the brutal world of finance and economics, I, I think some of these things all indirectly link together. So. <coughs> My, my presumption is if we get uh, policymakers agreeing uh, and pharma companies uh, coming into the, the, the business of producing antibiotics again, that in itself will create a whole market for VC that, that currently doesn't exist because they think there's no out. Uh, how many people here are involved in VC to do with cancer research? Oh, actually, that, now that surprises me. No more than there are in AMR. <laughs> but I, I think there's a lot more. And that's because they know there's an out. So if we can crack uh, the pull factor, the push factor will probably respond. Thank you, Lord O'Neill. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. <laughs>